when you're reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, understand that one of those writers, Luke, is a Gentile. Matthew, which of course we're reading the book of Matthew, was a Jew. He was a Jewish author. Luke is a Gentile. They write very differently from those different perspectives. Um, Matthew is saying things that a Jew would understand hearing, a Jewish person would understand hearing. Luke says things almost to where we understand it. He leaves out a lot of Jewish idioms, a lot of Jewish sayings he leaves out, and um, he writes very straightforward. Well, folks need to understand, this is covering the time period up until the death and resurrection of Jesus, up until about uh, AD 30. The book of Acts, who was written by Luke, takes up from AD 30, the ascension of Christ in Acts 1, all the way to late 60s, to about when we see Paul die. It's not recorded in Acts 28, but that's the time period. Probably right when the tribulation period is starting in 66 to 70 AD, Acts covers those years. So what we're going to do in this video series, and if folks are still hanging with us, I applaud you. Because up until now, we haven't been able to take the time to really dig into the meat of the prophecy. And we're going to do that in this video. And so if you are still with us watching, then I congratulate you because you are going to see in this video how we're going to do all of our study in Matthew 24 and all of our study in Revelation. Here's the deal. We've got prophecies recorded in Matthew 24. We've got prophecies re recorded all throughout Revelation. We are going to look in the book of Acts, that time period that Luke wrote from AD 30 to AD 70 approximately, late 60s anyway, and we are going to be looking in his writings because we believe he wrote the book of Acts not as a throwaway book, not of a book of random stories. He wrote Acts to show that the prophecies in Matthew 24, which are paralleled in Revelation, are all prophecies that were fulfilled in his day. Just as Jesus said in verse 34, in this generation. Now that's a lot of heavy lifting on our part, and that's what we're going to do. You know, for most of my, I'm sure I just missed it, but for most of my life, you know, when I would read Acts, you just read it like it's something that happened over a two or three year period. But no, it's it's a 40, 30, it's a 30 plus year 30 plus, yeah. history book. That's right. That's right. Let's dig in. So Luke, I like to call Luke an evidentiary writer. It's kind of a fancy way of saying he writes with the purpose of evidence. Um, Jesus made prophecies. Luke made sure that we knew that they happened. That's a way to think of that. So let's read this. Verses four through eight is all we're going to cover in this video. Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines, pestilence, earthquakes in diverse places. All of these are the beginning of sorrows. There's a lot there. And uh, let's have some fun diving in. First thing is, they were wondering when the sign of his coming would be. And at the end of this Jewish age, we talked about that a lot last time, the destruction of the temple. Remember, we talked about Mark and Luke not even recording this part right here of uh, the end of the world that's not in there. It's because, again, now that people are starting to learn more, you, will, you would notice now, um, I'm not going to go into it because we went into it last video, but you'll now begin to recognize why Luke wouldn't say the end of the world. It's a very Jewish thing to say. Because it's not the end of the world as we know it. It's the end of the world as a Judaic age Jew would know it. It's the end of their whole sacrificial system. That whole world ended. Luke wouldn't have seen it that way. So he didn't record that part. Matthew is showing the force of this. This temple is going to be taken away. That only has a lot of force if you're a Jewish person trying to use the temple for the atonement of your sin. Luke, a Gentile. He doesn't even record that part. He says, when shall these things be? What is the sign of your coming? Mark simplifies it. When shall these things be? 
what thing? Destruction of the temple. It's our Jewish author that says, and of the end of the world, and as we know, that word is eon, it means age or time period. Has, eon has the idea of eon and ionios. That's the, ionios is the Greek word for John 3.16, everlasting life. It's a time measurement. Cosmos, for God so loved the cosmos. Uh, that's the word world when we're talking about the whole humanity, cosmos. That's not the word here. It's eon. It's a time period. It's the end of the age. Okay? So Jesus says to them, first of all, take heed that no one deceives you. In other words, in the book of Acts, there would be a temptation for the disciples and the followers of Christ to be in such a bad place because things are going to heat up and get really wicked and get really bad towards the time of Jacob's trouble, 66 to 70 AD, with the Roman Jewish war. It's going to heat up as we get closer to that. And there are going to be people that are going to come by and say, I'm the Messiah. And Jesus is saying, don't you deceive, don't let them deceive you. It's not me. Now, how is Jesus so sure that it's not them? Well, if you understand it, how Jesus is saying it, it makes total sense. How did, how, how is Jesus so confident it's not going to be him? Because he's going to ascend into heaven. Now, if you take this as the second coming, you can't be so sure. Right. If Jesus is talking about the second coming and he says, one day you're going to see me, but it's not going to be me that you see. That doesn't make sense. He should say, look for me. I'm coming. Make sure it's me, but I will be there. Here he says, many are going to come in my name and it won't be me. How's he so sure? Because he's not going to be there. That's how he's sure. He's in heaven. He's at the right hand of the Father. He's going to be ascended during this time. So this is not talking about his second coming. It's talking about a coming in judgment. And people will come and say, I am he. I am the Messiah. And he's saying, they're going to deceive many. Don't you guys be deceived. I'm telling you right now, it won't be me. Why? He's going to be ascended at the right hand of the Father. It won't be him. Now, we do have um, many, actually, places to go for verses 4 and 5. Don't be deceived. Don't take heed that no man deceive you. Many shall come in my name saying, I am the anointed one. I am the Messiah. Remember, folks, G uh, Christ is not Jesus' last name. He's not Mr. Christ. He's Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ. The word Christ means Messiah or anointed one. So they will come and they will say, I am anointed of God. I'm the one you're waiting for. And uh, maybe they could even say, Hey, you guys have heard about this thing of dual prophecy. Uh, I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm another fulfillment of Daniel 9 and 7. And Jesus is saying, nah, there's only one Messiah, and I've already fulfilled that. So let's go ahead and look at a couple of, of, uh, of, uh, of instances of this in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 5 and verse, 30, 30, uh, verse 36. There's a guy named Thaddeus. Thaddeus, for um, before these days rose up Thaddeus, boasting himself to be somebody. That's the key. These guys are saying, man, look at me. Look at who I am. I'm, I'm a Messiah. Look what happened. To whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves, who was slain, and all as many as obeyed him were scattered and brought to naught. Uh, let's go ahead and finish this. This whole portion is very interesting. After this man rose up, Judas of Galilee in the days of taxing drew away much people after him. So there's a second person. He also perished. So Luke, our evidentiary writer, making sure you understood that many came in the name of Jesus uh, saying, I am somebody special. And here's two examples of, of Thaddeus and Judas. Many people after him. He also perished. Jude, uh, Luke is making sure you understand. They came, they died. They weren't the Messiah. And and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. That was the end of their movement. And now I say, and you refrain from these men, let them alone. For if this counsel or this work of men, of this or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it. In other words, what um, what's being said here is, if this is truly a work of God, you can't stop it. What's being talked about right now is that the disciples, the apostles, are preaching about the kingdom of God. And he's saying, you can't stop it if it's real. And if it's not real, it'll fizzle out, just like these men. Lest happily you be found even to fight against God. Don't, don't be on the wrong side of history here. 
And to him they agreed when they called when they had called the apostles and beaten them. They commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So these apostles of Jesus were being beat, saying, You guys are just like Thaddeus and Judas and these other movements. Stop it. So they beat the apostles, our heroes, our heroes of the faith. They beat them and said, Stop speaking the name of Jesus and let them go. This would be the climate for the next 40 years after the ascension of Christ. The apostles, the followers of Jesus, would be beaten and um, suffered terribly leading up to the, the Roman Jewish war. Sounds like a lot of persecution. Persecution ramped up, ramped up. Yeah, absolutely. And tribulation, to, some would say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Both of those words are, are absolutely applicable here. Here's another one, a guy named Simon. We call him Simon the Sorcerer. Some people may know him by Acts chapter 8 and verse 9. But there was a certain man named called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched uh, the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. Again, the same wording we see, Jimmy, of saying, I'm somebody great. Their self-proclaimed greatness, which is to say no greatness at all, really. You, you know, some outside sources even said that that Jerome, I mean, uh, that Simon claimed to be the actual son of God. Yeah, and really, if they're saying they're, they're somebody special, that's what they're saying. Yeah. But he used to use magic. He had a bag of tricks. He was called Simon the Sorcerer, to whom they all gave heed. Everybody listened to this guy, from the least to the greatest, saying this man is the great power of God. So they saw Simon as an extension of God's power. And to him, they had regard. Because that of a long time, he'd bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip, see, the apostles came in this vacuum and started talk, talking about who Jesus was, and people got saved. <laughs> well, if you're, a, um, if you're a magician trying to trick people, if you made money off of whittling idols, the apostles were bad news to you. They put people out of business. Jesus puts bad religion out of business. I would even shorten and say Jesus puts religion out of business. Jesus didn't come to be the founder of a global religion. He came to be the founder of a kingdom. Very different. A religion tries to appease a God to not have wrath upon them. Our king took the wrath of God upon himself. And he established a kingdom and he wants a relationship with us. I don't even tell people I'm not real. I don't consider myself religious at all. I'm in a relationship with the King of Kings. Amen. So these guys who are religious, in fact, if you look in the book of James and you look at religion, it's an act. I do. I would say I do religious acts, which is according to the book of James is loving the fatherless and the widows. But I'm not a religious person in the sense that I'm adhering to a system to appease God. Jesus did that for me. I'm in a relationship with him. I am safe and protected in him and want to obey him because I love him. And Jesus put religion out of business. It says here in verse number 13, Simon himself believed also. So when he heard Philip talking, Simon, the sorcerer, is like, wow, that is some legit stuff you guys are talking about. I want to get baptized. And I want to continue with you, Philip. I want to follow you. And you know what he did? He saw the miracles and signs which were done. He saw Philip healing people. He's like, wow, I want that in my bag of tricks. He missed it. So you, apostles, don't, you don't think he w truly wanted to be converted? There may have been an element to that, but here it says he was so taken back by the healing powers of the apostles that they, he wanted it. And so here we read, um, let's see how far we should go here. Oh, is it at the end of this chapter? I think, oh, here we go. Yeah, it's right here. When Simon saw through laying on of the apostles' hands and the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. When he saw them healing people, he said, how much money would it take for me to have this magic trick? I want to be able to do this. He, he has a lifetime of, of um, tricking people and doing magic. And they said, he said, give me this power also, that whoso, whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. I want to be able to do this. How much money would it cost? What's this for sale for? Peter said, thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that this gift of God may be purchased with money. He missed it. 
Thou hast neither part nor nor law in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. So that's what Philip's conclusion was, or Peter, I'm sorry. And so he told me he needs to repent from this wickedness and pray. So here's another one that had a big following, uh, said he was somebody special. He even said that he believed and got baptized. Whether it was genuine or not, it doesn't seem like it was because he was attracted to the the potential uh, advancement of his own business. That, that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. He he said he believed, and he even got baptized. Yeah. Yet Peter just told him, "You need to repent. You're not legit. <laughs> You're not legit." Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of these uh, false converts. Many Jesus said, "Many will come to me in that day, say, Lord, Lord, did we not?" Cast out demons and, and heal the sick in your name. He says, depart from me. I never knew you. This idea of authentic faith is so vital to our relationship with Christ. Second Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Peter records, and of course, Peter is placed in this time period of the book of Acts. So if you imagine the book of Acts as a timeline of AD 30 to AD 70 or late 60s, you can take the rest of the books from um, uh, Romans on and I could take out the book of Second Peter, and I could put it in the timeline of Acts so people can understand. So I'm pulling out of the book of Acts and reading a commentary on Peter and Second Peter. That'd be, a, were false. that'd be a great chart to find. Yes, we need yeah. to—I'll well, try to— Just for all of us to have and see. That's, that's a that's good visual. Yes, yes. So the timeline of 80, 30 to 70, you can put the rest of the books in there somewhere. So um, really, Acts is your master timeline of the New Testament post— gospels and the other books can fall into that timeline so uh, in fact you can even read when it goes in the book of acts it says something like you know and paul went and uh stayed in this place for three months well we know if he stayed there for example he wrote the book of you know so and so at that time period so you can go to that book and say he wrote something and you can go read what he wrote you know that kind of thing Verse 1, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, and bring up themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of the uh, uh, truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. It's all for profit. It's all for money. Whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. What did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 24? What did he say? He said, take heed that no man deceive you. When's he saying this? 80, 30. What's going to happen, Lord? Well, many will come in my name and saying, I am the Christ and shall deceive many. It's recorded for us in Acts and in other parts of the Bible as well, uh, other parts of the New Testament. And I always try to say, and Jimmy, I know you encourage us to go deep in these, but there's even more than we're saying here. I'm just trying to give us a flavor of it so we understand where it is. Um, okay, let's move on to verse 6. I hope those that are listening will think that we sufficiently showed. And by the way, for this to be fulfilled prophecy, I need to show one, only one. I'm showing multiple. I don't have to show you. If it says in Micah that there's going to be a Savior born in Bethlehem, and I show you that there was a Savior born in Bethlehem, I don't have to show you that there was two Saviors born in Bethlehem to make Micah true. Once it's fulfilled, folks, it's fulfilled. Once we see it, it happened. We don't have to keep looking for a prophecy to be fulfilled over and over again. All right, Matthew 24, verse 6. He then says, "Ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. I want to also point out real quick that if the, people that take this to say, oh, the war of Russia and Ukraine is what this is talking about. Jesus also said, be not troubled, um, <laughs> which is about the opposite of what these prophecy teachers, a lot of prophecy teachers today, like the David Jeremiah's of the world. I think David Jeremiah is a believer. I, I would never call him a heretic. I think a heretic is somebody who teaches a different way of salvation. Um, the Bible calls that those kind of people antichrists. They deny that the Lord Jesus came in the flesh and they teach a different message altogether about the issue of Christ. David Jeremiah acknowledges that Jesus is God's son and he's God in the flesh. 
and he's the only way to salvation. So he's not a heretic, but he sure is wrong about his eschatology. People like David Jeremiah, they are selling a lot of books based on fear. Be ready. What's the signs? Be ready. Jesus said, be not troubled. That's about the opposite of what people are doing today that are peddling that Matthew 24 and Revelation is in our, is in our future still. Just so people can hear this too, I think parts of Revelation are in our future. The advancement of the kingdom that we talked about earlier, the, the new heavens and the new earth are not completed. That's still being done. That's being worked out as the gospel advances. So I do not think all of it is completed. Where the church is growing still as an infant into a toddler, into a man. We'll see a little bit of that later. But Jesus says here, guys, ye, once again, who's he talking to? Disciples. disciples. For what? The destruction of the temple. What's the sign of this, Lord? Tell us. Well, guys, you, second person, personal pronoun, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Now, what, what can we take from that? Well, I think, Jimmy, I really believe what I'm about to say. I don't think anybody listening to us or anybody in Christendom would ever disagree with anything we're saying if we were really knowledgeable about what took place in 66 to 70 AD. Most folks have no clue what took place in the Roman Jewish war and leading up to it. Now, I want to say um, that we're going to get into some details in verse 7, specifically about the famines, that will be very difficult to hear. And I, I know Jimmy and I, you and I talked about whether or not to even include this in the video. We think it's important to include it because these details are real and most folks don't know them. But graphic, graphic violence took place from 66 to 70 AD. It lasted for about 42 months, exactly like the Bible says. These three and a half years were horrific as Rome overtook Jerusalem. So we're going to talk about this. Jesus said, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you be not troubled. Now, there's a lot we could talk about because as we got closer to the destruction of the temple, Rome uh, started to experience a civil war and they started to really have a lot of infighting. And, and they had had a bunch of peace for a long time, right? Yes. Thanks for bringing that up. There's something that people can Google, check this out. Because this, if, if, if this is true, which obviously we take it as truth, that means that you can go do research on the History Channel, if it's accurate, and check this out. And in fact, you can. What time period would it even matter for Jesus to say, let me give you a really good key indicator. You'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. Every time period has wars and rumors of wars. Yeah, we've always had wars as long as I, yeah. I can remember. And then history shows us, you know, forever. Yeah. I mean, when World War I came, I mean, a world conflict, that seems like that would probably be a good time for verse 6 to be a fulfillment. Mm -hmm. And I many mean, thought oh, it was. And many thought it was. Mm -hmm. And then in 1941, 1942, World War II. Then we have the Korean War, the Vietnam War, Iraq. the war, Iraq War, yeah. um, Desert Storm. Um, I mean, you know, there's always wars. Now, my point is this. Is it proper for us to see the, the war of Russia, Ukraine and say, oh, yeah, prophecy is being fulfilled today. Jesus said for us to, first of all, that's not accurate. Jesus told the disciples that they would hear and see, not Ken. Um, I'm being a little snarky right now, so bear with me. I'm being a little bit, um, I mean this in a humorous way, but I call this chronological snobbery. <laughs> chronological snobbery is when you read a timestamp story in the Bible of chronology and you look at it and go, oh, this is talking about me. I call that chronological snobbery. You assume everything's about you. <laughs> when he says to the disciples, that it's for them. So there's only been one backdrop in the history of the world where this would have made sense. 
and folks, you can Google this, please do educate yourself on this. It's called the Pax Romana, P-A-X Romana. And it's the, the uh, Roman peace is, the, is what that means. It's Latin for Roman peace. The Pax Romana uh, began when Octavian, Augustus, defeated Mark Antony and Cleopatra in the Battle of Oct- Octium in, on September 2nd in B- 31 BC. It started approximately a 200-year span of peace in the world. So that's 31 years approximately, probably more like 28 because our years are off, about 28 or so years before Christ was born. The world had been experiencing peace. They say, why? Because Rome conquered the known world. They're in charge. There's one guy in charge. And if you dare get out of line, you could look at the road lined with crosses and see what they do to you. That's right. And so they they kept peace by ruling by force. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Rome, you know, as we've we've heard so many times, Rome um, led with an iron fist, and they didn't take any, any garbage from anybody. And that is exactly why, understanding that background, that's why the Pharisees used that against Christ. This guy thinks he's king. What did you guys hear about that? This guy wants to do a political revolt. That's why the, that that and that'll make more sense in Revelation when we understand that the beast is Rome and then there's another beast that rides on it. That's the land beast is Israel and the sea beast is Rome and and they rode Rome until Rome bucked them off and devoured them. I mean, that's exactly what happened. We'll get into that. I will show that in great detail in Revelation. It'll be so obvious. You'll look at that and go, how does anybody not even think that? It's so clear. Yeah. But that's what happened. So we have this Pax Romana, this Roman peace of 200 years. That's the backdrop that Jesus is born into. 30 years after it begins, we're in Matthew 24. So we've had, I'm sorry, did I say that? 60 is what I meant to say if I didn't say that. I don't know what I just said. 60, said did I say 40? <laughs> did I say 30? Okay, yeah. 30 plus 30, I had that in my head. So we have 30 years until Jesus is born. 30 years later, or approximately or so, um, we have Matthew 24 is being spoken. So we have 60 years of global peace in the Roman Empire. And Jesus says, guys, you're going to start hearing about wars. Now that matters because there hasn't been any side of it. Now, there's a lot we could talk about. I want to talk about specifically getting started. People can check this out. In AD 69, so one year before the temple was destroyed, a civil war was going on in Rome leading up to the destruction. Because they're asking about when the destruction of the temple is going to be. AD 69 is a significant year. Let let me back up just one year before that. Nero um, commits suicide in AD 68. He kills himself because of political pressure. And also, um, he is he is overtaken and said that he cannot be doing a good job. And there are people vying for this position. And Jerusalem is an increasing problem. So there's this area of Judah, which of course where we have Jerusalem, that it begins to be a problem for the Roman Empire. These guys are just bucking the system. Nero is not getting it done. He oppresses them big time, but he kills himself in in AD 68. Now, there's a vacancy for emperor, and so people are vying for this. So in AD 69, we refer to it as, if you want to Google it, YouTube it, check it out. It's called the Year of the Four Emperors. That's kind of the way history has dubbed this thing. In a span of 18 months, there was four different emperors in Rome, which is just crazy. You know, imagine if we had four different presidents in one year because they all were killing each other. That's what we've got in the Roman Empire. So we have the year four emperors. Check that out, AD 69. This is the this was the ma- major civil war in Rome. Here's how it went. Nero committed suicide on June 9th in AD 68. A guy named Galba took over. Um, this was an older guy that um, folks saw as maybe could stabilize, but... Uh, no, uh, he didn't do a very good job. And a guy named Otho came over and took over for him. Uh, Gilba wanted somebody else to succeed him, but Otho was the one that did. So uh, this made Otho get so mad that he killed Galba. 
So just, you know, easier to just kill somebody, right? Otho killed himself when a guy named Vitilius wins a battle to overtake him. So a guy named Vitilius says, I can do a better job than you. Otho sees that he wins, kills himself, okay? Now, Vitilius, he killed a mob. Uh, he was killed by a mob set by another name. And here might be a name people recognize, some com- sometimes called Vespasian or Vespasian. He's the one that came and said, I think I'm going to do better than any of you. And indeed, he did. He brought stability to Rome. He was the fourth emperor in such a short amount of time. Vespasian uh, was there, and he's the one that began to uh, carry out this conflict against Jerusalem. He ultimately uses his son named Titus. Now, Titus wasn't the emperor at this time. He would become the emperor in about 10 years at this from this time but vespasian used him as a, as another arm and he's the one that said vespasian said to his son titus go figure out this conflict in judah so rome is in an all-out civil war leading up to the destruction of the temple and folks need to understand what's going on at this time not only that what we were just talking about but also uh some people also ask me about this they will say hey ken if this is true it says nation shall rise against nation. How is that true if we're talking about the Roman Empire? There's only one nation. Let me, let me discuss that for just a second and address that. Because even though we're talking about uh, one Roman Empire, there are still nations in the Bible. And let me show you that. Here's Romans 15.24. Paul says, Whensoever I take my journey into Spain, he still recognizes Spain as a nation. Spain is independent in a sense. Uh, let's let's go ahead and move on to another one. We have in Acts 18, in verse number two, we have a, a mention of Italy right here in Acts 18.2. But wait, there's more. Matthew chapter two and verse number 13. Of course, we know when our Lord was being under was potentially under attack as an infant we know that joseph departed remember where he went into egypt egypt was still a nation all of these were independent nations we could go on i think that's sufficient all of these were independent nations within the broader spectrum of the roman empire so nation against nation obviously is still possible even even israel still considered itself a nation absolutely absolutely i mean you have Herod, very interesting, Herod was an Edomite um, and, uh, you know, it wasn't too fondly thought of. You can, you can read about how well Herod was. That's why he redid the temple, to get in good favor with them. But yeah, yeah, they were still their own nation. Well, wasn't the high priest, didn't he kind of prophesy that one man should die for the, for the nation? For the nation, yes. Good call. That's exactly right. I was trying yeah, to find that, and I couldn't find yeah, it. Yeah, he was chastising them toward, towards the end of Matthew. He was chastising them, saying, you guys are missing the boat. And here's what's interesting about that passage. Is that guy wasn't necessarily a godly fella. <laughs> but but he was still tackle. the high priest. He knew. He knew the information. That's a great passage. Good call on that. So Jesus says here, you're here of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. Again, and I'm not trying to—, to uh, uh, well, here's an English idiom. I'm not trying to beat a dead horse here, Jimmy. So if somebody 2,000 years from now watches this video, they're going to go, they used to beat dead horses to make a point. No, now that's an English idiom. And I'm not trying to beat a dead horse here, but let me just say, Jesus is saying, building up to the destruction of the temple, you're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. Why? Because all these things must come to pass. Must come to pass for what, Jesus? For the end to come. The end is not yet. The end of what? The end of the temple age. Very simple. If we didn't hear such bad teaching on this, this would be so simple. But we have to undo bad teaching. That's what makes it hard. If you like this video, hit that like and subscribe button. And check out the full episode by clicking the link below.